Would you open your Bible to uh, the book of 1 Samuel, uh, is where we're going to be this morning. 1 Samuel chapter 8. Uh, but before we get there, uh, we're going to jump into the book of Proverbs. I'm really excited for the proverb of the day. So glad you guys are alive today. <laughs> Man, did you guys come to church or like, uh, who needs some coffee? There's a whole pot out there. <laughs> uh, Proverbs 27. Maybe you'll enjoy it once I read it. Forever, uh, whoever blesses his neighbor with a loud voice rising early in the morning will be counted as cursed. That's great. That's great. You know, maybe that's me right now. As I'm trying to be cheerful and, and loud, and you guys are like, no, we want to go back to sleep. I, um, there was this, this, this point in my life where I was young, and I wanted a truck really, really bad. So I bought my first truck, and the, the one that I could afford was a 1968 Ford F-250. And I decided with one of my friends that I was going to see how it sounded if I just took the muffler off of it. Um, and and I, I looked underneath of it, and I, it had clamps on it. I said, that's easy. I'll just unclamp and, and just pull the muffler off one day, and just I'll see how it sounds. If it's way too loud, I'll just put the muffler back on. So I unclamp it, and of course, it was really rusty, and so I was underneath it, like, wiggling around, and it just snapped off. And uh, so there wasn't just the slipping it back on. And I was like, well, hopefully it's not too bad. And I started that thing up, and it was the loudest it was so loud, and of course, being in 1968, it had, you had to start it with the choke on, so it automatically went up to like 2,500 RPMs when you started it, and my neighbors loved that, that first day at 6.30 in the morning when I was getting ready to go to work, and I went outside to warm up my truck, and he came over after like two days, and he said, can I buy you a new muffler? <laughs> That's what that proverb is about right there. Preach a whole sermon on that. All right, we're going to dive into the Word today. Um, would you be willing to um, stand as we honor God's Word? Um, okay, 1 Samuel chapter 8. We're going to read um, through verse 9 this morning. When Samuel became old, uh, he made his sons judges over Israel. The name of his firstborn son was Joel, and the name of his second was Abijah. They were judges in Beersheba. His sons did not walk in his ways, but turned aside after gain. They took bribes and perverted justice. Then all the elders of Israel gathered together and came in, uh, to Samuel at Ramah and said to him, Behold, you are old and your sons do not walk in your ways. How would you love just the, the people of Israel coming to you and going, Hey, you're old. We want something new. Now appoint for us a king to judge us like all the nations. There's a point right there. What do they say? They say, we want a king like everybody. We want to be like all the other nations around us. Give us a king like everybody else. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed to the Lord. And the Lord said to Samuel, obey the voice of the people in all that they say to you. For they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me from being king over them, according to all the deeds that they have done from the day I brought them up out of Egypt. He said, they've rejected me all this time, from the time I brought them up out of Egypt, even to this day, forsaking me and serving other gods. So they are doing to you. Now then, Obey their voice, only you shall solemnly warn them and show them the ways of the king who shall reign over them. Let's pray this morning. Lord, we thank you, um, Father, that we get to spend time in your word this morning. I thank you that your word is, your scripture is breathed out. It is your word breathed out. It's profitable to us. So Lord, we pray, um, Lord, would you speak to us through this? Um, Lord, would you be with us this morning? Uh, and would your word not return void? In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You can go ahead and have a seat this morning. I want to preach a sermon that I have titled this morning, Give Us a King. 
We've been in this series um, titled um, The Church in Exile, and I'm not, I'm not deviating from that, but we've been in the book of Daniel. Today, we're kind of going to bounce around a little bit. We're going to actually spend most of our time in this chunk of Samuel looking at um, the time that they appoint for themselves a king. I think it's, it's pertinent to what we're dealing with in the world and what we're dealing with in our, really in our nation right now as we're coming into, we are in the middle of election season. How many of you have voted already? Most of you have already done it. I'm going to speak a little bit today. Um, here's my hope. If you voted already, I, my hope is this, that you've got confidence in the decisions that you have made and you have peace in that. Um, and if not, if you're not there yet, um, I want to speak to that and, and give you um, some peace in that this morning. I know that we don't have a king in the United States, and I think most of us say praise God for that. We don't have a king in the United States, and I think uh, the majority of us don't want a king in the United States, but I think we still fall prey to maybe the heart behind and this desire of Israel in this moment that says, give us a king. The desire is, is less about the king that they had. It's less about that, and, and really for them, it was more about their rejection of God being their king their rejection of, of God's plan and, and purpose in that moment. And I, I'll say this, I really believe that we have one of the, one of the best government structures and systems, uh, one that spreads out authority, provides accountability, allows for, this is one of the things I, I love about our, our system, it allows for the greatest potential of righteous influence. So long as we, the righteous people, don't just willingly give away that power to unrighteous leaders. But as great as it is, it is still flawed. It's not God's ultimate design. But he gives us um, the ability, like we see in this chapter, he gives us the ability to appoint leaders um, and to, to make kings. God has a desire, though. His ultimate desire is this, for his people, which we are his people, that ultimately we would be ruled and led by him and not by the king, not by a king. They have not rejected Samuel as a leader, but they have rejected God as being king over them. And is that sometimes not often the, the struggle that we have today, that it's, it's rejecting God from leading us in so many different areas? And we're about to um, elect for ourselves the next person to lead this nation. I think that's a pretty big deal, huh? We would agree that's a, that's a big deal. So I want to speak to how do we walk in integrity and how do we vote righteously? Let's look um, deeper into what God says and what God desires for a king. We might not have a king, but we do have a senior most leader, a commander in chief, one who will choose to tax us, one who will send our children to war, one who will uh, have the power to start and end wars, and one that can negotiate peace with our enemies. And God warns Israel of, of these, these things here as they demand, give us a king. Give us a king. We're going to jump back into 1 Samuel 8 in, in verse 10. It says this, so Samuel told all the words of the Lord to the people who were asking for, um, asking him for a king. He said, these will be the ways of the king who will reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them to his chariots and to be his horsemen and to run his chariots. He will appoint for himself commanders of the thousands and commanders of fifties and some to plow his ground and to reap his harvest and to make his implements of war and the equipment of his chariots. Notice it's all about his things. He will take your daughters to be perfumers and cooks to be bakers. He will take the best of your fields and vineyards and the olive orchards and give them to his servants. He will take the tenth of your grain and your vineyards and give it to his officers and to his servants. He will take your male servants and female servants and the best of your young men and your donkeys and put them to his work. He will take the tenth of your flocks 
um, and you shall be his slaves. And in the day you will cry out because of the king whom you have chosen for yourselves, but the Lord will not answer you in that day. It says this, for the king that you have chosen for yourselves. That's, that's a very interesting note because we're going we're gonna to read in other places how the Lord wants to deal with them appointing a king. So we might not have a king in our land, but I think when we boil it down, oftentimes the results that we see, they're very, they're very similar today because we end up, we place flawed men and women in power, and then we reap the results of that. That's what the Lord is speaking to. As you place men who are flawed, they're selfish in nature, you will end up reaping the results of appointing them to lead. And are we not seeing that right now in our cities, in, in our counties, um, the, the, the state of our cities, the, the state of our, of our counties, the conditions of our state, the conditions of our nation are a result of who we choose to place into power. It didn't just happen like this. We have chosen to place certain people into power, and we end up, we reap the results of that. Here's the thing is that this moment, as they, as they say, we want a king, give us a king, it didn't come as a surprise to the Lord when they came demanding it. He told them all the way back in Deuteronomy before they even... Um, uh, before they even come into the promised land, he said, there, there's going to come a time where you will ask for, and I will allow you to appoint a king. We're going to read that in just a moment here. He told them um, that they would desire a king, and then he, he begins to give Israel the qualities of the king that they should look for. Um, these qualities I don't think they often look for in a king. Here's, here's what he says um, in Deuteronomy um, chapter 17. When you come into the land that the Lord your God is giving you and possess it and dwell in it and say, I will set a king over me like the nations that are around me. You may indeed, he gives them that, you may indeed set a king over you whom the Lord your God will choose. Notice he says here, whom the Lord your God will choose. But in Samuel, he says, you will reap who you choose to put into place. From uh, One from among your brothers, who you shall sat, set as king over you. Uh, you may not put a foreigner over you uh, who is not your brother. And then he goes on and continues, only he must not acquire many horses for himself or cause the people to return to Egypt in order to acquire many horses, since the Lord has said that you shall never return that way again. And he shall not acquire many wives for himself, lest his heart turn away, nor shall he acquire excessive silver and gold. These are the things that the, the Lord begins to, to lay out of who should lead Israel. But here's the thing is that the Lord was to choose who was to become king. The Lord was to set. How often in the scripture do we, do we read about them going before the Lord in participation with the Lord in selecting a king? How many times do you think? Out of the 43 kings in Israel, three of them, they, it's noted that, that the Lord participated in selecting that king. Saul, David, and Solomon. And after that, there, there was no participation. Now, I'll say this, that, um, that all of Solomon's line was, was blessed, but I think there is still some participation there that they ought to have had. Here's the thing is that out of those 40, I think it's kind of telling because out of those 40 um, kings, uh, aside from the three, out of the 40 kings, um, both in the northern kingdom of Israel, after Solomon, uh, Israel splits into two kingdoms, the northern kingdom of Israel, the southern kingdom of Judah. The southern kingdom is, is Solomon's line that continues on. Out of the 40 kings uh, in both of those nations, we only see eight of them. Eight out of the 40 
are said to be good kings that follow the ways of the Lord. Only eight of them. Now, we can clearly um, see here that 100% of those kings, uh, out of the eight, 100% of them were in Solomon's line. So all of the ones who rebelled against the Lord were counted as bad kings. But here's the thing. So uh, zero of the ones that were selected outside of the Lord's blessing in the northern kingdom were called good, but they were still kings. They all walked outside of God's will and blessing, and they led Israel into idolatry. So God may set up kings and remove kings, but, and, and he has the ultimate authority, but we still have a choice in the matter. We still can choose to walk in the, the path of righteousness and blessing that the Lord has laid before us, or we can choose, like all of the northern kingdom, to walk outside of God's will and blessing. And here's the thing, and this nation, we have a voice in that, that we have to choose to steward as Christians, as, as righteous people, we have to choose to steward the voice that the Lord has given us in this nation. How do we do that? How do we steward that? Here's the, the biggest point of the, this morning is this, is that we discern the will of the Lord. The Lord said that he would participate in the choosing of the king so long as they allowed him to. The most important part that we have, I believe, the most important part that you can do in this season is allowing the Lord to lead you and to direct you through this not allowing the media, not allowing the news, not allowing TikTok, not allowing Instagram, but allow the Lord to lead you in his spirit to, to guide you during this season. You have the most powerful metric of righteousness at your disposal as you, as you vote in this season, and that's the discernment of the Holy Spirit. Not because the media says so, that's not why we, why we would vote a certain way. Not because a party says so. Not simply because maybe the majority of Christians around you say so. But there is peace when you go before the Lord and you seek him. The biggest thing that we choose to do is discern the will of the Lord in these things. We need to spend more time listening to the Holy Spirit and less time listening to Fox News and CNN. What does the Holy Spirit say in this? And I, I, think, there's, I, I think we should understand there's a difference oftentimes as we, as we look in Scripture. There's a difference between the king that we want and the king that we need. We see that in Scripture. There's a difference between the king that, that we, we want and the king that we need. Because... It, it, the Lord says, you will want a king like all of the other nations have. But that's not the king that I have for you. That's not the king that you need. You will want to be like all of the other nations. You'll want what's, what, what looks good as a king, strong, powerful, good with resource, handsome, charismatic, all these different things. Think about um, we'll, we'll read, when Samuel goes to appoint David, he gets to his, all of his older brothers. David's dad didn't even like, think he was even a potential candidate and left him out to tend to the sheep. He wasn't what, he, what they wanted as a king, but he was the king that they needed. 1 Samuel 16, when they came, he looked at, upon Eliab and thought, surely the Lord's anointed is before me. Samuel says this, surely this is the one. Surely this is the king that we want. This is what we desire. This is the, the image of a king. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look on his appearance or his height of stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as a man sees. So what do we need to do? We need to discern what does the Lord see, not just what man sees. 
Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Often the king we need is not the king that we want. I know that I have a tendency, as probably each of you do, to look at the outward things, to take my, my first thoughts uh, as, as the outward things and say, yes, that, that looks to be the part that fits the bill, rather than, than, than taking the, the slow, longer route and allowing the Holy Spirit to discern the matter with me. This must be what's right. But we need to take time to discern what's right, not just what the world around us says what is right. It's easy to vote for someone because they have more charisma, because they look nice, because they're, they're smooth with words, because they make promises about our, our happiness. But none of that defines a good leader. So often in culture, though, that's exactly what we're doing. We're, we're promoting based on those things, and, and not just politically. We, we, do it in, we do it in the marketplace all the time. We go, oh, th- this person, like they, they fit all these bills. They must be a good leader because they have all of this charisma. Um, Forbes says this, uh, promoting someone based on their likability or charisma rather than their leadership capabilities often leads to issues in the long run. Leadership is not about being popular, but about making tough decisions, inspiring others, and driving results. It's not a popularity contest. It's not voting for the homecoming court. It is putting in the person who will lead the best, who will lead righteously. Like Samuel, we have to choose to look deeper than just the appearance on the outside and discern the wisdom of the Lord. And can I encourage you, if, if you're unsure of what to do, and, and, and you don't have peace in this situation, James 1.5 says, if anyone of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given to you. Seek the Lord in this time. Seek the Lord. If you, if you lack wisdom in, in, in how to walk in this season, if you lack peace in this season, seek the Lord, and he will lead you and guide you. Seek the Lord and shut off the noise of the media. The Lord will lead you. His word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. And let me just encourage you, if if you have not voted yet, sit down and as you begin to walk over your ballot, listen, I'm just going to let you know, I'm not going to tell you how to vote this morning. (laughs) But sit down and look over your ballot and the voters pamphlets, the guides, the, the tools, whatever you might use to inform your decision and do so covered in prayer. Spend time with the Lord and, and seek him for wisdom because he'll give you peace in that. We want to align our will to the Lord. That's how we approach voting is through the discernment of the Holy Spirit. All right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you this morning um, I, I think a, a few top things that the scripture would point out as things to uh, look for in both policy and candidacy. These are, listen, these are my top four. You might have different top priorities, um, but the, the things that you have priorities over should be founded in scripture. I believe that all of these are priorities that the Lord has for a king who leads. Number one is righteousness. Righteousness. Deuteronomy 17, as he continues on giving them what a king should be. And when he sits on the throne of his kingdom, he shall write for himself, not just the law for not just the book of the law for the people to have, but he he should write for himself in a a book a copy of this law approved by the Levitical priests. It is his own copy, 
it shall be with him and he shall read it in all the days of his life that he may learn to fear the Lord his God by keeping all the words of this law and these statutes and doing them that his heart may not be lifted up above his brothers and that he may not turn aside from the commandments either to the right hand or to the left so that he may continue long in his kingdom, he and his children in Israel. Let me just uh, point out the elephant in the room. I don't think any of our presidential candidates fully live up to this, do they? And, and none leading up to this have lived up to this. Why? Because we're not looking for the king of Israel. We're looking at a secular candidate. We shouldn't have a a higher standard than what it is. But that doesn't mean that we say, well, neither one fits the bill, so I'm going to throw up my hands and just walk away. That's that's not stewarding what the Lord has given us. We should still seek the one that will lead in greater alignment of this and not further away from it. I think there are plenty of, of candidates, and not, not just speaking of, of our presidential election, but all the different offices that, that we vote for. There are plenty of candidates and policies that are in direct opposition of righteousness. And we need to seek the Lord and discern those things that are, are in direct opposition of righteousness, and, and we have to choose to stand for righteousness. I, I want to vote for somebody who's standing for righteousness on topics like abortion and sexuality and, and what we're teaching our kids in school. These are important things. We, need to, we, we might not get perfection, but we should vote in a direction that's leading towards righteousness and not in the opposite direction. Number two is stewardship. <clears throat> stewardship is another one that the Lord warns about with a king. He says he's going to take your good things and the best of your grain, the best of your flocks, the best of your family for his gain. And that's not good stewardship. All of it was about personal uh, gain and personal possession. Samuel, um, 1 Samuel uh, 8 again, he will take the best of your fields and vineyards and olive orchards and give them to his servants. He will take the tenth of your grain and of your vineyards and give it to his officers and to his servants. He will take your male servants and female servants and the best of your young men and your donkeys and put them to his work. And he will take the tenth of your flock and you shall be his slaves. He will tax you for his business. We need to look at, at the stewardship of the things that the Lord has given us. I believe that's a, it's a big point in the scripture. Proverbs 22, 7 says, The rich rules over the poor, and the borrower is slave to the lender. I don't believe that debt is inherently evil, just as money is not, but it comes with a steep and slippery price. The borrower is slave to the lender. <clears throat> the U.S. national debt is at $35.8 trillion. Did you know that? That is a shocking number. $35.8 trillion. The borrower is slave to the lender for $35.8 trillion. The U.S. national debt has an interest payment, a yearly interest payment of $475 billion of interest. That's wasted, thrown away money every year. I think we should, we should care about those. As, as righteous people, we should care about those things. How are those things stewarded? We need to look at, at those things. Number three, peace and security. Peace and security. I know that war is oftentimes inevitable. They, wars happen. 
I don't uh, live in a false reality that we will make a, 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 a great utopia of this world and we will have, have peace and never have another war again. That's not a reality because there's a lot of evil people in this world who make war. But there's a tendency of kings in Scripture who send the nation to their personal battles rather than the ones that the Lord has called them to. And, and we have to look at our nation and discern those things as well. A, a leader that makes for peace and security. Um, verse 19 through 20 says this, but the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel and they said, no, but there shall be a king over us. Listen to what they say that we also may be like the other nations and that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. Now that is an important thing, that they would go out before us and fight for us. But how often were the kings going out and fighting the battles of Israel? I mean, David stayed home and committed adultery while he should have been on the front line with his people. David, the 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 chosen king these are still flawed men committed adultery while he should have been out josiah went on a personal battle that the lord told him not to fight and engaged in it and he lost his life because of it peace and security are important things let me let me just speak to this how i know there's there's plenty of parents in the room you sleep at peace Think of this, as, as you talk policy and things, think of this, you sleep at peace when your door is locked at night and your sons and your daughters are home where they should be. That's when, that's when you sleep at peace at, at night, right? We should sleep at peace. It's important that our sons and daughters are home when they need to be home and our doors are locked and secured, not just letting any random person in off the streets. Peace and security, those are, those are a big deal. And they're a big deal in the scripture. They're a big deal to the Lord. Um, Psalms 122.7 says, Peace be within your walls and security within your towers. When they went to rebuild Jerusalem, they began, and, and, and it wasn't finalized until they had fortified the city and put the walls back up. There's an important piece of security to a nation. All right, number four is Israel. <clears throat> this is a high priority in Scripture. It should be a high priority as, as we look at these things. The Lord says that I will bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you. Speaking of Israel, I will bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you. I don't want to be on the other side of that cursing. Psalm 122, um, 6 through 9 says, Pray for the peace of Jerusalem, that they um, may they be secure whom love you. Peace be within your walls and security within your towers. For my brothers and companions, I will say, peace be within you. For the sake of the house of the Lord, I will seek your good. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. I believe that's still a call to the church today because Israel, whether, whether you see it or not, it's not just, just simply another nation on this earth. Israel is still a very important part of God's redemptive plan to this earth. And we are still called to stand with Israel today. I'm going to close here and I'll have the, uh, the team come back up. Those are my four priorities. But let, let me close with this. It says this, They have not rejected you, but they have rejected me from being king over them. And I think that that should hold a lot of weight to us. As Christians, Jesus needs to be the king over us. He needs to be the king over us. The one that we allow to lead in every decision day in and day out, 
not just in how we, we vote, but in every area of our lives. We still have a desire to make for ourselves a king that we want. How we want to rule, how we desire it should be done. They had the same exact goal when Jesus came. There's a moment where Jesus feeds the, the 5,000. We, we know this story. And immediately, as, as soon as that is over, he gets in a boat and he, he goes and he, and he sails away. And he goes up onto the mountain and, and he goes to be alone with the Father because this crowd of over 5,000 was seeing the miracles. And they were saying, surely this must be our Messiah, the one who has become, who has come to be our king. They still had an idea of the king that they wanted versus the king that they needed. And they wanted to, to take Jesus and, 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 and by force make him to be king and to rule and, and, and to, to wipe out the rule of the, the Roman Empire at the time. They wanted to take Jesus by force and make him king. It says this in John 6. When the people saw the sign that he had done, they said, this is indeed the prophet who is to come into the world. They knew that. Perceiving then that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, he withdrew again to the mountain by himself. We want to force the king that we want versus the king that we need. A.J. Swoboda, a um, doctor of theologian, I got this in an email this week. This is, what he, this is what he writes. He says, they missed, they have missed, speaking of this crowd here, Deuteronomy's 17's clearest prescription, no human can anoint the true king. Not speaking of the little king, but the true king because God has already made him king. They can't take him by force and make him the king they want because God has already made him the king that we need. And of course, Jesus couldn't be made king by force for the one uh, glaringly evident reason. He was already the king. Their attempts to use force to try to make it happen would be impossible I'm sure the gospel writers had this list from Deuteronomy 17 that we read of kingly expectations in mind when they portrayed Jesus. The only time Jesus goes to Egypt, speaking back to that he, they should never enter into Egypt, is as a refugee. He was a man who had no place to lay his head. He had no wives. The only animal he ever rides is most certainly not a horse, but instead he rides a humble donkey. It is though Jesus was the king Israel always needed, but never wanted. He's the humble king and he's already king. We can't come and force it. We can't put a, a king that we want because there is already a king. The king that we need is already appointed. It's not whether we can appoint a new and better form of king. The question is, will we allow Jesus to be the king he already is in our lives? Will he be the, the ultimate one who rules and reigns in every decision that we come into? Will my faith and my trust be in the one who is already a king. That he might, he's not coming in with, with all of this power right now that they wanted in Israel. But he is already the king. Let's pray.